Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 280 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be covering one of my favorite topics, uh, the history of video games. It's something that I have really dedicated my, my scholarship to. I thought I would show you uh, briefly some of the books that I've worked on over the years to give you some sense of, my, of the scale of this, <laughs> the scale of my obsession. Uh, so you see, we've written books. Some of these are written with my friend Bill the Judas. I've got one called Vintage Games Cons Vintage Game Consoles, where we look at the rise of uh, the PlayStation, uh, the original Nintendo, all the computers, Commodore 64, the Amiga, and so on. Got a couple of editions of Vintage Games 2.0, where we talk about the uh, most influential games of all time: Minecraft, Doom, Super Mario Brothers, Pong, all that. Uh, and then probably my most famous book is this Dungeons and Desktops book. Just came out with the second edition of that. Uh, and that's, you know, as you can see there, the history of computer role-playing games. Uh, so we really, I really focus in here on, wrote this uh, with Shane Stacks, uh, all about the computer role-playing game, all the way from the early days up through, you know, your Skyrim and uh, the Witcher series. So it covers a lot of ground. Now, I know I've mentioned this before, but if you do want to uh, look at these books, they are in the library here. <laughs> of course, and of course, you could always buy them, but a little cheaper to go to the library if you like to check those out. Uh, but anyway, I'm just saying this is a topic that I could go on about for days, months, <laughs> years even. <laughs> uh, don't worry, though. I'll try to keep these comments here short and sweet. Uh, but if you do have a passion for this stuff, you know, I like to hear from you, uh, especially if you're into role-playing games. Uh, but anyway, here's the question to start us off. Uh, so why do you think students like yourself should be interested in... Or let me uh, just read the question. So why should students interested in making or studying video games learn about the history of the industry? In other words, why is learning about older games and older movements useful, uh, whether for making your own games or just as something you're studying in college. Why is this useful? All right, so moving on then, a little outline of the uh, the lesson today. We'll be talking about some of the stuff that came before video games. You know, and by the way, uh, I understand the limitations of our current book, uh, Understanding Video Games. I mean, they, they're trying to cram a lot into one chapter. This is somebody who's written multiple books on the topic, and I find that even a whole book's not enough. <laughs> uh, so I will forgive them for omitting certain things, but uh, I did want to supplement what they say a little bit because I think they, they just missed some uh, really important stuff, so I will include that here uh, so you'll get more than just what's in the reading. Uh, but we will cover some of that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this question I just asked you. You know, why does this stuff matter? Why is it important? Uh, then we'll take some of the uh, some of these eras, and I've broken up their format a little bit. I didn't, I don't know if it necessarily makes sense all the time to stick to very strict chronological uh, order on this stuff. So I've kind of put some, I've reorganized it a little bit. Uh, I think the key thing is just to think about those really key games, uh, the real uh, innovative and revolutionary titles that spawn genres and things. That's, that's kind of how I approach this topic. A little different than just going year by year. Uh, and then we'll get into some perspectives on the future. Where What might we learn? What are some of the big lessons we can learn from video game history? And then I've also uh, thought about some objectives for this lecture. Uh, so we want to be thinking about those key innovations, the key moments, uh, the rise of uh, real-time versus turn-based, uh, for example. The, these uh, shifts from console focus uh, to things like uh, handheld games and mobile gaming and social gaming and you know you name it <laughs> the, the MMO there's been a lot of stuff that's happened uh, since the uh, 70s and before that so I want to get into that why those moments are important uh, and again the influential games the genres they spawned I, I think to call a game really influential uh, for me that means that it's it not it wasn't just popular at the time uh, but that there was a bunch of other games that followed that format that imitated it uh, something like Dune 2 for example uh, leads to uh, ultimately to Warcraft and Starcraft and uh, Command and Conquer. There's basically a whole genre. Uh, or if we look at games like Doom, 
you know, it's not just Doom. I mean, the whole first-person shooter thing became a, a genre. Uh, so I think those games are the ones worth uh, focusing on. Uh, also, understanding why and knowing the history of video games is helpful for making a new game. Also, analyzing the impact on society and culture. In other words, there's a lot of lessons. Even if you don't, you know, you don't want to make a game a classic game or a vintage game style. But I think if you know what came before, especially there's a lot of games that were really promising and popular, but they just kind of been forgotten. Uh, there's a lot of titles like that that would be great to go back and revisit some of those concepts and see where you can go uh, with that. Uh, here's a game called Sinnet. I think that's how you pronounce that. I didn't, I didn't actually look up the pronunciation. Looks like Sinnet. <laughs> uh, this is one of those really old games. I guess they've dug up some artifacts. They're claiming this comes from uh, 4,600 years ago. So 2686 to 2613 uh, BCE, BCE or before the Common Era. Egypt's third dynasty. And, you know, of course, we really don't know too much about this. But, you know, you can clearly see <laughs> some kind of game. <laughs> uh, and I haven't, I don't know a whole lot about this, but apparently they have found a lot of these uh, old models with the game board, game pieces. Maybe it served uh, just entertainment value. Maybe it served some kind of religious, ritualistic value. You know, I always wonder, you know, how much do we really know? We might think we know a lot about this ancient stuff, <laughs> but, you know, obviously we weren't there. Uh, so we can, a lot of this is speculation. Uh, and then some other examples of early games. There's uh, the one down here in the lower left-hand corner. is called Go. And this is still played today. You can find Go players, especially in Japan. But I've come across them in the U.S. plenty of times. Uh, it's not a game I play. i do not even really sure how to play it. Seems a little bit like, uh, uh, what's that game? Like you play in a Cracker, cracker Barrel. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it kind of reminds me of, but uh, there's a lot of rules to this. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting because it's one of the games, a lot of these old games, there's these, uh, uh, the perfect, uh, the people that are into artificial intelligence try to make what they call the perfect uh, game of Go or the perfect game of chess. Uh, so the, basically the, the idea is, are the rules such that you could make an AI that could play a perfect game every time, basically beat any human player? And as I recall, Go, the rules of this are complex enough, or there's enough uh, of a random factor or whatever. It's complex enough, I suppose, that they haven't been able to do that, at least last time I checked. Uh, they've had a lot more progress with, uh, of course, Tic-Tac-Toe has been mastered. Uh, the uh, chess, I don't know if they have quite there yet. They're definitely getting close if they're not already there to a perfect chess game. And not something I follow. I'm more of a video game guy <laughs> than board games, but... Uh, it is interesting to think about what, how this, uh, who was it, a Brian Sutton Smith, I think, that was making the point that the more sophisticated the civilization is, uh, the more sophisticated games you find in, the, in those uh, civs or civilizations. Uh, and I think we see that here. You know, certainly these games get more and more complex, the rules, and more and more people play the game, they develop strategies, they write books about it. I mean, chess, I mean, you can read, you could basically study chess your entire life. And even then, would would you really have mastered that game completely? I mean, it, it seems like one of those games where there'd always be something you could be working on, uh, something exper you could experiment with. People do dedicate their lives to these. And, you know, of course, the Olympic Games, you know, I'd almost be tempted to put that more in, in the sports category. Uh, but again, there's something where there's, you know, these are still with us. You know, it wasn't a linear trajectory on that, but we still talk about those as games. Uh, then moving on, we have something called Kriegs, uh, Kriegspiel, or Kriegspiel, Kriegspiel. Not quite sure how to pronounce that. It's a German word. I'm not German, so forgive me. Uh, but these are uh, what's called a war game. And I did have, uh, if you follow my Matt Chats on YouTube, I had... Uh, one of the guests one time came to St. Cloud State. His name was Dave Wesley, and he was in the uh, military playing these war games. He sort of had a he kind of launched the renaissance of the war game. Uh, they'd have been uh, sort of canceled for a while, but then come back. Uh, but as you can see here, the idea is it's yes, it's a game in some sense, but it's not just a game for fun. Uh, they're basically playing these games to try to learn about strategies 
And uh, Wesley's, uh, Major uh, Wesley, his, his uh, what he was doing, I think, was tanks. Uh, so they were trying to teach uh, these officers about how to mobilize tanks properly in the battlefield and uh, thinking about the different kind of tanks and the different sorts of terrain. Uh, so, yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. But the point is, it was a, it was a real-life application. They were playing, I guess it's a lot cheaper to move little pieces like this around a board uh, than it is to actually have the tanks out on the out on the field moving around wasting gas and and whatnot. Uh, so there's this, and there's a lot of uh, speculation too that this sort of thing led to D and D because you in effect have a dungeon master out. Uh, sometimes they play these games out in the field too. They have people running around. You know, some of you probably were in the service, uh, so you probably played some some of these war games. But they, they actually have people out in the field that will basically they're kind of like referees i suppose uh but they also sort of set up the scenario that you're playing and they decide uh you know what's fair what's unfair what's how, how the game plays out that enforce the rules so basically there's a little bit of a dungeon master or game master like a uh, quality to, the, to these games uh, but they go way back you can see 1824 and it's prussia if you haven't heard about prussia before you know later this gets uh, uh wrapped into germany but the Prussians were really well known for their military. You know, they still kind of look back on like the the really top discipline, uh, the uh, expert tactics, really great <laughs> precision. You know, uh, all that. A lot of uh, innovations happened in Prussia. All right, so something a little less violent is um well maybe a little bit less violent depending on who you play it with. Monopoly. Uh, this, I guess, goes back to 1935. I think there were versions. They mentioned another game, sort of similar to this, that was happier and more cooperative. <laughs> I think it was like Mansion of Happiness. Now, that didn't last too long. People like this Monopoly. I think the kind of the brutality of this is what makes it fun. You know, I bet you've probably played Monopoly before, and if if you haven't ever played this, you know, just just I think you can go to Walmart, pick up a set you know, ten, twelve dollars probably and, and play this with some friends. Uh it's got some problems, I suppose, but I th I think it's a really well designed game. I mean it's been around since nineteen thirty five. That ought to, ought to tell you something. Uh but they give the they talk about how this game there's a little bit of a I guess a capitalist element to it. You know, you're trying to get real estate and people uh, you're trying to get rich off of other people. So they kind of make the point in the book and how this kind of makes sense, given that uh, the era that it comes out and the, the fact that we are in a, a capitalist society, we have this kind of game. Uh, that other one, I think, was a, more of a more like a socialist type game, as I recall, utopian style. I mean, you know, that's kind of interesting to, to ponder on, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, Monopoly. Uh, now, here's one that they didn't mention in the book that I think is important, uh, leading to a rise of video games. The game called Stratomatic. And some of you have probably played this. If you have played uh, any of the fantasy sports, fantasy football, you know, I think some in some ways those are descendants of this game. Uh, these are really popular. They go back, uh, there were earlier style games like this going uh, even further back. Uh, but this is basically what you'd call something like fantasy baseball. Uh, there's some pretty significant differences to it, but there's a lot of uh, statistics involved. You're running games, simulations, and uh, putting together teams. And there's a you know a lot of dice involved, uh, so it's not too hard for me to make a stretch from this to uh, Dungeons and Dragons on the one hand, but also the computer games, because there was a lot of math with this. And anytime you have a lot of math, uh, usually it's easier if you have a computer do the math, uh, and that's pretty uh, easy to see how that leads to uh, computer games. And a lot of the developers I've talked to, especially the producers, uh, Brian Fargo of Interplay, uh, for one, but uh, Electronic Arts, the founder of that, Trip Hawkins, is another guy who was really into Stratomatic as kids. Uh, so there's that as well. This is something they, they would have played a lot of and know, know a lot about, learned a lot about statistics from this and logic, computer rules and logic, uh, things that would make it easier to make video games. And I don't, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of sports games that are even, even I think that there's probably safe to say Madden, a lot of the other uh, 
especially once you're getting into like management type sports games. I think you see some heritage there with uh, the Stratomatics. Uh, and then what the heck? They don't even mention pinball? You know, it almost made me want to get a refund on this <laughs> this textbook. Like, what the heck? You're not talking about pinball? Uh, this was a huge thing. Uh, I don't think you probably don't realize how far back pinball goes. And it's one of those things, too. People get kind of hair splitting about what is, what's a real pinball machine. You know, if it doesn't have a spring-loaded thing, is it pinballed? If it doesn't have the little bumpers on the side or the flippers, uh, is it pinball? You know, I, I tend to think it's probably a little much to say that goes this far back. I think you really see maybe in the, certainly by the 50s and 60s, but certainly in the 70s, you really see pinball taking off. And there's a documentary called, oh shoot, what's it called? Extra When Lit or blanking on the title. Uh, I'll see if I can find that and put it in the in the notes for you. But there's a really great pinball documentary. Uh, matter of fact, I'm just going to quickly look this up. <laughs> I'll pause this. <laughs> yeah, so here it is. Let me bump it back here so you can see. Um, special when lit. So I think you can watch this. Looks like it's $4 to rent it on Amazon. Uh, but, but well worth it. You know, while I'm over here too, let's take a look and see if they got my movie. Because <laughs> uh, I did a movie with Bill LaJudas too. I don't. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so while you're watching videos, you can also watch uh, the movies, the movie that I put together with Bill LaJudas and uh, Richard uh, Goldwhite directed this gameplay, the story of the video game revolution. So <laughs> a little bit higher production values than uh, what you're going to see in this video we're doing now, this lecture. Now let me get back to it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, pinball. Uh, so Nolan Bushnell of Atari, he was uh, at a carnival. Uh, he was running all these sort of carnival games, but, you know, they would also have a pinball. And it wasn't just pinball. They had baseball-type games, a lot of what they call electromechanical uh, devices that were basically was an arcade before there was arcades. And if you're ever in Las Vegas, stay away from the casinos. Because what you, what you really want to do in Las Vegas is go to the Pinball Museum. It's a little bit away from the main fair, uh, but it is, it is awesome. <laughs> I was at a conference, a convention there one time. We went to the Pinball Museum. And, I mean, it's like the games. I think they're all for free. I think you pay to get in, and then you can play as much pinball as you want. And you could just go from pinball, get pinball machine to pinball machine all day, basically, and not run out of uh, pinball games to play. It's absolutely incredible. All right, so enough geeking out about pinball. Uh, here's a Dungeons and Dragons, and this is a, you know, you again, this is a subject we could talk about all day. Uh, there were games before this. Chainmail uh, was invented or written by uh, these these same folks, or I think it was Gygax did Chainmail, and then Arneson came around and added some of the other stuff. Uh, again, if you go back and watch those Matt Chats with Major Wesley, he talks a little bit about more about some of the untold story of how this game came about. Uh, there's a lot more to it than most people think. Uh, but what's interesting for us is a lot of this stuff, these, these folks were in Minnesota and in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin tends to get more of the credit, but there was a lot of stuff still to this day. If you go to the Twin Cities, there's a group uh, that meets to play D&D. &D, and a lot of those people are the original D and D crew. I mean, the people that invented the game are still playing it in these little games in the Twin Cities. And if you ever go to the uh, some of these conventions, the uh, role playing conventions, some in Wisconsin, some in Minnesota, but this is basically where all this stuff originated here in the uh, Upper Midwest, which I think is is awesome. Frankly, it's a good reason to uh, live here. Maybe it was uh, maybe these cold winters, you know, gave people a lot of time indoors so they could come up with these fantastic games uh this is the theory uh but you know in these games and you probably played some dungeons and dragons before uh if you haven't i think you're missing out you know so find a group of friends uh go to any of the game shops here in town there's a oh what's the name of it uh uh, uh oh i can't believe patties there we go <laughs> uh patties game shop there's sneak attack there's lion gate or lionheart games 
Uh, just go to one of those shore, uh, stores. Uh, there, one's down. Patty's is downtown. You can go to uh, Lionheart's over by the mall. And then Sneak Attack is on the way to the theater, if I'm correct. But you can just stop in there and talk to the who's ever working there if you see some people playing and say, you know, I want to play some D&D. &D. And they can hook you up. And I think it'll, it's going to be really great for you. Uh, you're going to have a lot of fun. It's a very creative game if you like coming up with stories, if you like coming up with characters. Uh, you'd really have a good time with it and this is you know somebody who plays a lot of video games uh, I can tell you it's it's not the same you know you might think it's the same as playing World of Warcraft or something there's certainly things that are similar uh, but it's a different experience and I think everybody should try it out at least once all right so back to this question of uh, does history matter why are we studying this and they now, the authors do make a couple of good points. Uh, one is the point is not to become some type of walking encyclopedia of video game factoids. You know, what was the first game to do this? What was the first game to do that? Uh, who was the second key grip <laughs> on this, on this uh, game, whatever? You know, that's not as important as uh, just having a more of a general sense of the major movements, the major developments. Because uh, you need, you do need to have some background. Uh, otherwise, you know, you'll be always thinking something's new uh, when it's really as old as dirt, <laughs> for, uh, for one thing. Uh, but again, if you really want to understand the cultural influence, the impact of games on society, uh, you do have to know more than what happened last week. Uh, we also need history to see how conventions arose, true, uh, establish genres such as real-time strategy games, now, so a lot of times, the stuff we just take for granted, you think, well, that's just the way games are supposed to be. You know, you're supposed to have a mini-map. You're supposed to have uh, a, a guy with a question mark on his head. You can go click on to get the quest. And you think, that's just how it's always been. When really, that's relatively new stuff. And it's it's kind of cool just to see where, where was the, where did that originate? What was happening? How did they handle that before? And what are some alternatives to that? Uh, so it gives you some some context that's helpful. Uh, you can be inspired by the past successes as well as the failures. A lot of times we'll go back, we'll find this old game, remake it. Uh, but sometimes people just take bits and pieces of the old games that they would like to see uh, in newer games. Uh, they talked a little bit about little computer people, uh, games like this that they were moderate hits, you know, not a lot. They kind of just faded from the scene, but then they come back as The Sims. You know, The Sims wasn't an exact clone, uh, but they took, you know, parts of that earlier game that they thought would work well and uh, ran with it. And then they also talk about the games moving. Again, if, you, if you're coming to this class from a social, sociological perspective or a cultural studies perspective, you want to see how there were times when gaming meant you were in an arcade. as you know, dusty, smoky, whatever, you're in there playing with other people. Real crowded, noisy. It was kind of like the thing to do on a Saturday night. Uh, so it moved from that era to the console era where now everybody's back home and on their couch. And now we're kind of moving into this online era where everybody's connected again. So you can see it kind of moves in and out of private and public spheres. And we have all these weird flukes that uh, people love to talk about like the DDR. If you remember that, there's some new newer games along those lines. But Again, that was a game that you didn't just play at home. I mean, the point was you went to an arcade or the mall or wherever they had the, uh, you know, that game going, and part of it, part of the fun was being there with your friends and letting them see you dance. Uh, let's see some other. Oh no, uh, I guess now we're moving into the early video games. Uh, so let's see if we can get this to play. Got the volume here. This is the Tennis for Two game. Uh, this first one, Knots and Crosses, was an Ed Sack. Uh, basically, I should let me set this up a little bit. Uh, so both of these games, as you can tell from the years here, uh, this is way before personal computers or game uh, consoles. Uh, so basically, a computer meant uh, this giant refrigerator-sized or even a tractor-trailer-sized machine. <laughs> You've probably, probably seen them in old movies uh, with all the tape reels and all that. Uh, but what would happen is they would have these little fairs or like come and see the science at the museum today. You know, come to the lab. 
kind of like these little promotional events. And the scientists there would put together these little games for the kids and I guess the adults so they could play. And it'd be a, it's a little more fun to see that than just see some the computer crunching on some numbers, uh, turning out a spreadsheet. I mean, who wants to see that? Uh, a little more fun to play something like tic-tac-toe with a computer uh, or tennis for two. So the tennis for two is uh, Hickenbotham. Uh, he's the one that created this. Let's see if they'll show the uh, show the game. So you can see that there's a little bit of a basically a controller, and there's what it looks like. And you can see this is not on a regular computer screen. It's not a computer monitor. This is an oscilloscope, basically the same type of uh, device you see in medical applications. Uh, so lots made of this. You know, I think this, you know, there's some debate about, well, is it a video game since it's not really a video? <laughs> it's an oscilloscope. <laughs> I mean, you see the hair splitting that goes on with these kind of questions. I don't find it, I don't get into like what was first, that sort of question, because there's just all, you know, somebody can always find something and make a case for something else being the first or something else being simultaneous with it. And again, you just get into kind of useless hair splitting. Uh, I don't even really like to bring up the uh, I'll show that message again. Uh, I don't even like to usually bring up this the tennis for two and this other stuff just because of that problem. Uh, it just tends to be a rabbit hole, and who knows how many people actually played those. You know, it is kind of you just had to be there. I think that was Brookhaven. I'm not sure even where that was. New Jersey, maybe. Could be wrong about that, uh, but it was, you couldn't say that millions of people saw it or thousands of people saw it. Uh, this next example, though, is one that I've definitely talked to people like Bushnell and several others who did play this. So this is one, if you talk to somebody who's a really early uh, game developer, they probably have at least heard of Space War. Uh, so I think you can make a pretty good case. Maybe not technically the first, uh, but certainly one that a lot of people saw. It made a difference. It was influential. Um, and you can see it's also not quite what you would expect from a video game and it was remade later into various arcade games you can play it on your computer but you, know, you can see there's kind of a competitive element to it you know you get your friends and you're trying to shoot <laughs> down uh, his or her rocket you know so that's what that looks like now i think it's it's quite a bit of fun and this this was some guys at mit uh, they were working on, they were part of something called the Tech Model uh, Railroad Club, I think. So it was these guys that would get together on the weekends or after classes, and they'd make these uh, really elaborate models of uh, trains, these electric trains. I think, what does that have to do with anything? But if you really study the way train, these the models work, there's a lot of uh, logic circuits built into the train tracks and you know controlling how the trains moved, and you had to coordinate with the other trains. So it kind of led, you know, these are basically engineering type people uh, who were fascinated by that stuff. But uh, what they were doing here, they had this computer, I think it was a DEC PDP, which was, uh, the difference with that was the when IBM had their computers, the students weren't allowed anywhere near the computer, right? All you could do was submit your programs on these punch cards, and that was, uh, you know, it was all handled for you. Uh, whereas with these DECs, you know, you could actually get your hands on it and play around with it. Uh, so these students really got into that and they were hacking it, uh, which meant they actually come up with this term, hacking. Uh, they were talking about, like, just what's some crazy stuff we could do with this machine. You know, like kids with the old pocket calculators trying to see what kind of crazy program they can put in there and really uh, impress people. Uh, so that's really what this game is. It was just a guy, his name was Slug, or his nickname was Slug Russell. And he was just kind of playing around to see what he could do. And they come up with this game and it just took off. And everybody was, you know, they since it was on this deck machine, they could copy this, send it to their friends at other universities. And it really got to be a, probably the first hit, really. So this is something a lot of people would have played if you were, well, by a lot of people. I mean, maybe computers. I don't even know if computer science really existed at universities at that time, but... Uh, certainly, if you were into like electronics engineering, something like that, and you had access to a computer like the DEC, uh, you probably would have seen this. You would have had a good chance to play it, not just at MIT, but 
you know, in other universities. Uh, so what we have here is a link to Space War Game. They tried to kind of recreate what this was like. So uh, what I want you to do, if you can't get it to work, you know, don't worry about it too much. But uh, to see if you can grab a, grab a buddy and open up this link and see if you can play a few rounds of Space War. And then uh, after you're done with that, come back and just talk about what that was like. And again, with all these, try to imagine that you're back in the day playing this. I mean, obviously it doesn't hold up to, uh, you know, the, the it's not going to, it's not Elite Dangerous, okay? <laughs> uh, but I think you can see how it would be fun. Uh, then we get into the 1970s. This is really what, what I consider to be the birth of the industry. Things start to get commercialized. Things are being sold in stores for the first time. Of course, you have all these arcades popping up. Uh, we'll get into some of those games. Uh, the earliest video game consoles, so you could play the stuff at home. And for many, many years, really up and maybe up all the way to the 90s, the video game consoles depended on the arcades. So the pitch was always... You know, this console is almost as good as the arcade version of Pac-Man or uh, Miss Pac-Man or, uh, or Pong, for that matter, or any of these games. You, know, you would have played the real version at the arcade. Uh, you know, Street Fighter 2, if you remember that, uh, same sort of deal. Uh, so that was the authentic version, but then you might have this version on your Nintendo you could play at home. It wouldn't be quite as good, but, you know, it was good enough, I suppose. Uh, later on, of course, that changes. The arcades begin to fade. And we also see the rise of the personal computers, which is really what I like the best. Now, I've always been more of a computer gamer or PC gamer than a console gamer, uh, but I try to talk about both. Uh, let's look at Pong, uh, since this game was such a big deal. You know, everybody talks about Pong at these game studies conferences if you start talking about history. Uh, it's Alan Alcorn. He worked uh, with Nolan. I think Nolan Bushnell had made this game earlier called uh, Computer Space, based on that Space War game. It flopped. Uh, this one was a big hit, though, Pong. So they're putting these machines up in bars there in California, but it, it took off. And you know, I, th I told you before, Bushnell was into these, uh, not just pinball, but these carnival-style games. So he wasn't a stranger to putting games in bars. Uh, but this was something new. It was a new type of game, the video game, right? And they, they put this thing together with an old, I think they got the TV from like a Walgreens <laughs> and I built this, uh, uh, I built all this. But, you know, it's a huge hit. And I, I'm always, whenever I go to one of these uh, museums and they have the video games history exhibits, they usually have a big pong set up somewhere. And every time I've gone to one, it's been really uh, revealing that even though they have, they might have hundreds of other games in there from all the different eras, but the one that gets the most attention is always Pong. You know, you always see a big group of people gathered around the Pong. Uh, it's not like this. I usually have it projected up onto a screen, uh, but it's it's a lot of fun to see like grandmas and grandpas there with like their grandkids, and everybody's just having a good time playing this uh, relatively simple game. Uh, so it holds up well. And one of the arguments that Bushnell likes to make. And I have interviewed him, by the way, in that movie I was showing you earlier. But uh, one of the things he always points out is that the that computer space or the space war game, that was great for the sort of engineering types, the nerds, basically really educated uh, scientific style minds. Uh, whereas Pong was just really simple. You know, anybody, you, you just see somebody playing this and instantly you, you know how to play. Uh, yet there's a lot to it. And, you know, as you, if you play this, like I'm recommending here with a friend, you'll see there's some strategy to it. You know, you can be good at Pong or you can suck at Pong. <laughs> you know, that's a good way to put this. They call it easy to learn, hard to master. She just did the phrase they use, but it was a big hit. So take a few. I think it's worth our time to play a few rounds of that. Uh, again, grab a friend. I think it's the only way to really experience it. Not as much fun by yourself. Uh, if, if you have, If you're a parent with a kid... Uh, call your kid in and play some Pong uh, with the kid. I think you'll have a good time. And then uh, talk a little bit about that experience. All right, here's some other uh, key action games. And, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm aware that we don't want to spend, uh, <laughs> you know, 100 hours on this stuff. I don't have my clock handy to 
I've gone about half an hour already. Wow. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to briefly mention these. Again, I've written whole books on them. Uh, you can watch the gameplay documentary if you want more detail. I've also posted links, but you know, I'll at least try to hit the highlights here. Uh, these are out of order. This one on the bottom is Space Invaders. And this is a, I'm one of these games that's kind of become a pop culture phenomenon. Uh, they didn't really mention this in the book, but one of the things that makes this special is that it's not an American game. You know, up until now we've been talking about all these American games, games made in the U.S. Uh, this is made in Japan, uh, Tamihiro uh, Nishikado. It's really the first in what would become, you know, a huge booming industry in Japan. They probably have made more video games there than, than have been made in the U.S., or at least as many. Uh, and one of the big breakthroughs was, of course, the Space Invaders game. And again, you can play this. I'll have a link here in a minute so you can try this out. It's a little easier just to play it than for me to try to describe it. Uh, and then Asteroids is another one of these big classics. Kind of a coincidence, my friend Jamie Hyman, if you know him, he's a professor here. Uh, but he just, just so happened to find this ast big Asteroids poster at Savers. <laughs> I think maybe yeah, I was Savers. And so he gave me that to put in my office. So if you ever come to my office, I'll show you my Asteroids poster. Uh, but this is, if you notice the graphics on this Asteroids game, it might be a little hard to see here, but the uh, most games are what they call raster graphics. So it's little dots or pixels that make up the images like a newsprint, newspaper. The, the Asteroids, though, is called a vector game. And what that means is instead of little pixels, there's lines. And so everything's a little line, like some kind of weird uh, medical device of some sort. And it's really trippy to play it if you find one of the arcade versions. You try to play it on a PC, you know, it's still basically going to be the pixels. Now you have to find a dedicated machine to really see what these vector graphics are like. But it's really strange. It's, it's kind of far out, freaky. It's almost like a psychedelic experience. So you're not going to get the same results by just playing the simulation, but, you know, at least you get some sense of it. But if you ever do see an Asteroids machine somewhere, uh, you know, I highly recommend that you play that just so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, let's see, the adventure games. You know, this is that genre that we've been talking about where the emphasis is on the story and the characters. And they give you some examples here of these. Hunt the Wumpus being one of the early ones. And I think that's basically just... Uh, you're, t you're traveling in a hallway looking for this thing called a wampus and you're firing an arrow. It's uh, pretty simplistic. Uh, the big breakthrough was this game called Adventure. It's also called Colossal Cave or Colossal Cave Adventure. It's a Crowther in Woods. And this was one of those games like we were saying with the Space War where it gets spread around. A lot of other people, a lot of other universities are playing this. And there's a connection to D&D &D here as well because these folks were playing a D and D and they wanted a way to play D and D uh, on a computer. So that's part of the inspiration for this colossal cave. Uh, the big one though is called Zork. And if you watch that show, Big Bang Theory, uh, Sheldon will talk about Zork sometimes. I think there's a whole episode about Zork, which is really cool. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, that's how you know that somebody's doing the research on, on the show. They really know uh, their stuff. Uh, we will play a little bit of Zork here in a minute. But all three of these, the thing about them is that they're all text. There's no pictures, there's no graphics, no uh, sound effects. It's all done through just kind of like the way a dungeon master would tell you, like, well, you're in a dungeon with some kobolds, blah, blah, blah. And so it's that, same, it's that same kind of idea, but, you know, this will be you're in a cave or you're looking at a house, and you can tell the computer to do things like, uh, well, look in, look in the box or uh, see if I can open the door. Now open the mailbox, uh, read the letter. You, it's just kind of like you're just having a conversation with the DM. It's, you know, when these games are done really well, it's kind of like that. Of course, you do have to be specific. You can't just type anything in, right? You have to say very specific. Usually it's something like get letter or uh, light lamp. Uh, you have to think about the right verbs to use because the computer doesn't understand everything. Uh, but generally, the Infocom games, they are known for, you know, pretty much anything they can accept or make some kind of sense of. Uh, Mystery House, it takes this concept, but it does have pictures, illustrations. Very, it's laughably bad. 
<laughs> it's kind of hilarious. It's almost creepy. It's like something some, you know, you imagine, uh, oh, who's that? Uh, oh, that killer. Uh, the, oh, you know, the crazy killer guy. Hang on, let me pause this. Yeah, Charles Manson. <laughs> Charlie Manson. Kind of looks like something he would have created. Uh, so I'll let you look that up if you want. Mystery House. Uh, here's a link to Zork. Uh, so again, just try this out. You don't need a friend for this one. You probably don't want to have anybody around. Because uh, it's more fun just reading this. So you're going to just be reading text and then typing in responses. Uh, so try that out. See what you think. You know, this is one of the first big hits, by the way. Uh, this game was on just about every computer system would have some version of Zork. You know, and by the way, this was, uh, we'll jump into this a little bit later, but that was one of the big advantages of having just the text because you could make a version for Commodore uh, 64. You could make a version for Apple II. You could make a version for the uh, IBM PC. And since it was just text, you didn't have to do that much coding uh, to make those, uh, make the versions for those different systems. Uh, whereas if you have graphics like this, uh, then you got to figure out how does that system handle graphics and there's a lot more coding. So you have to have a lot more programming in there uh, to try to make uh, to uh, what we call it port it uh, porting. So you port a game like Empire or Zork to another system. It's easier if it doesn't have graphics or very simple graphics. Uh, so here's some strategy games, this other genre. Here's one of the, my favorites, uh, Empire, uh, 1978. I think it's Walter Bright that creates the first version of this. And I have interviewed uh, some of the folks that made the later versions uh, for the computers. It's, it's, it's a special game for me because I played it so much with my dad. <laughs> you know, we, we probably played hundreds of hours of this. You know, every weekend it was like the highlight to you know, uh, play this game all night. Uh, but it's a turn-based game, so you're building these tanks and ships and moving them around, and you take turns. And you know, as you as you the later that you play, like this is turn 126. So sometimes your turns can take like 20 minutes or even longer. Uh, so that gives you time. You could read some comics while your dad's playing. <laughs> Come back and play some more. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it's a fun game. Uh, and there's some other ones here I just listed out. Uh, Civilization's a big one. They try to put that in like a process category, like you can't win it. I don't know what the heck, you know, but you definitely win civilizations, different ways to win. Uh, and it's multiplayer too. Uh, Dune 2 is one that gets brought up a lot because it's one of the early, maybe the earliest uh, real-time strategy game. There's that Herzog game that, uh, Herzog's Y or Zway. <laughs> Uh, they try to bring that up all the time. As, oh, this was earlier than Dune 2. But, like, nobody's ever heard of that. Uh, I guess it's some kind of Sega, obscure Sega game. You know, part of the problem, too, with having games coming out in Japan and the U.S. and some of these other countries is that they didn't always get ported over, right? So you might have a game that was, it was well known in Japan, but just nobody ever translated it and brought it over to the U.S. Or if they did, it never went anywhere. Uh, so there's a lot of cases like that where... You talk to a Japanese developer, they yeah, oh yeah, they, they know about this game. Uh, whereas you're like, I never even heard of that. <laughs> so, a lot of examples, and vice versa too. It wasn't all just one way. Uh, Warcraft, if you play World of Warcraft, uh, a lot of that is based on these earlier games, but these aren't massive uh, multiplayer online games. These are real-time strategy games. And you could play them with friends, online but just you know think like two or three people uh, these aren't the massive uh, massive uh, persistent universes or anything uh the command and conquer is another series or cnc and then of course starcraft which became an, the first esport uh, so a few other developments here the muds mud stands for multi-user dungeon so literally what this was they were trying to and i have interviewed uh, richard bartle and he talks about this. Trump Shaw kind of, for his, I think he was doing this as part of his, like a senior project. So he kind of did the project. And once he got, once he graduated, he was done with it. Uh, but Bartle uh, was intrigued enough to want to continue, see what he could do with this code and actually launch, the, launch it into a game. So he's really the, the, the main person here. 
Uh, but anyway, the idea was to take that Zork style game, the Colossal Cave Adventure, and instead of having just one person play it, uh, if you could have this be a persistent world, so you could have all these other people around the world uh, in the world with you, they could talk to you, you could uh, work together on puzzles. Uh, of course, uh, later on, you could fight monsters. He brought in like a Dungeons and Dragons theme to it so you could fight creatures. And, and again, it was all text. But the big deal was, since this was on these servers, and this is a little, again, a little bit before modems, you wouldn't be playing, you probably wouldn't be playing this at home. Uh, at least at first, you'd have to be at a university. Uh, but the cool thing was, it wasn't just the game. You could chat with people. And this is before really... Uh, anything like Facebook or anything like that, or before texting and, and so on. As a part of the thrill, and I remember playing these when I was in college, and that was in the, people were still doing this in the 90s. Uh, I remember going to a computer lab one time to work on a paper, and there was a guy sitting next to me, and I kept looking over there at his screen. It, was, it looked like he was like playing D&D, it's like orcs, and he's fighting like stuff. <laughs> and finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. I'm like, look, dude, <laughs> I have to know what is that thing you're doing? And he's like, oh, it's a mud. And I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, I'm like, you know, 18. I, I never seen this. So he had to explain what was going on. And uh, he showed me, like, how to log into it. Man, I probably lost. <laughs> That's about all I did. <laughs> I was playing these muds. I mean, I just loved it. Uh, but part of the thrill was, you know, you'd be playing this. I mean, here I am in, like, Natchitoches, Louisiana. And here I am playing with somebody. These other people might be in New York or California or a lot of times in other countries, depending on what hour you were playing. Uh, so it's a very social experience. You know, I met a lot of friends, and it, it was a big deal. And this was back when that was really unusual. You know, most people didn't know somebody that lived that far apart. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of it was just chatting and being socializing or socializing. Uh, but it is a big, big step forward. And of course, those that's what evolved into uh, World of Warcraft and what have you. Uh, another big development was the video game Crash of 1983, also called the Crash Christmas. You know, and I have talked to the uh, Howard Scott Warshaw, who did E.T. He also did the uh, uh, Yars Revenge. So he likes to say that he's the guy that created the best game ever, Yars Revenge for the Atari 2600, and the worst game ever, E.T., the extraterrestrial. But I'll say that as much people that say E.T. sucked, you know, I think a lot of them probably didn't play the game, so there's that. <laughs> and, you know, there's a case to be made that it's not actually that bad. Uh, it's just kind of the, the go-to line. This uh, There's a Pac-Man game by Ed Logg, and the problem with that and E.T. really was that the hype, uh, the hype was incredible for these games. Like, oh, we're going to get Pac-Man on the Atari 2600. I mean, Pac-Man is huge in the arcades. Uh, so the idea that this is going to be on your Atari at home was just mind-blowing. And all the kids wanted it. And the version that came out was, uh, you know, again, it's not as bad as they make it out to be. But it was certainly nothing like the arcade version. And so that was a big disappointment. And this E.T. game is just weird. It, you know, go go watch my interviews with Howard Scott Warshaw. He's a weird dude. I mean, he's like smoking pot all the time <laughs> amongst other substances. And I think he had like two weeks to make the game. He's just a really crazy guy. I'm kind of amazed anything got made at all, uh, given the way they were operating at that time at Atari. Uh, but anyway... You talk, when I talked to David Crane of Activision, uh, his, one of the founders of Activision, uh, he gives a different story, and his story was that you know, the problem wasn't that just E.T. or Pac-Man. Uh, the problem was that this was a, sort of a gold rush era, so you had all these crappy games, what we'd call shovelware, uh, even companies like Quaker Oats uh, was making games. I mean, it's just games everywhere. And they got to be so many games that basically sucked. Uh, you go to Montgomery Ward at the time, or Sears or J.C. Penney, where they were buying these games, and you know it'd be like this. Yeah, you could get the uh, latest Activision game or something like Centipede, which is a good game. And, you know that might be. You can even see there. It looks like a Target label on that. It looks like it's thirty-two dollars. You know I can't quite make it out. 
But you know, you do the math on that, you're looking at probably at least 60 to $70 for that. Uh, but then you look over there and there's this big bargain bin of games and you got like the Quaker Oats game and a Perina Dog Chow game, you know, and the, what uh, Crane says happened is the parents were there for looking for games for their kids for Christmas and they would say, well, look, I can get like five of these games out of this bargain bin for like five bucks each. Uh, why don't I just do this and then I'll be able to give my kid like 10 games instead of just this one game uh, that's like 60 bucks. Uh, so that's the way he spends it. Uh, there's also the uh, home computers. So this is a lot. This is kind of nefarious in some ways, but there was a lot of advertising around the idea of why get your kid an Atari 2600, this game machine, basically. All they're going to do is play games on it. Uh, instead of buying them that, why don't you buy one of these computers? like a Commodore 64 or an Apple II, and then they'll be able to learn how to program it, and they'll be able to uh, do their homework on it, and then there's business stuff you can do with it. And they also play games. So you kind of have your cake and eat it too, and it wasn't that much more money to get a computer than it was just to get the, uh, the Atari at this point. So a lot of people too, they say that was kind of another factor uh, that just people weren't buying the consoles because they could get these computers for about the same price, and the games were just about as good. That uh, was the argument. Uh, and then finally, I guess one other thing about this, these kind of games, and this is something we still see, is that they spent so much money on the licensing. So they, they would think, well, just because we've got E.T., that was a huge movie, very popular, you know, any game with that E.T. logo on it, and the E.T. licensing is going to do well. And of course it did. You know, it sold like a gangbusters. Uh, same thing with the Pac-Man. But even today we'll see. Oh, here's a game based on this latest hit movie. You know, a lot of people, they rush out to buy it. And then when they get home, they find out it's really just a crappy game. It's not anything great. Uh, there are exceptions to this, but usually it's it's a piece of crap. And people just bought it because they liked the, the movie. I mean, that's happened. There's even a, a game based on Beethoven the dog. <laughs> like millions of these. Uh, and they, they're crap. All right, and then the, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of these home computers. Uh, this is what they call the Holy Trinity sometimes, uh, the early batch. You know, we got the Commodore PET. It didn't stick around too long, but it was popular in schools. A lot of these were, if you know these machines, it's probably because they had one at school. Uh, when I was in grade school, or was it grade school? Yeah, it seemed like maybe around the seventh grade, or no, it was earlier than that. Uh, it might have been like fourth grade or so. Uh, they'd have a room with like an Apple II in there, or a Trash 80 or TRS 80. And you might have a, an activity one day where you go in there and play a game on this or do some kind of activity or exercise. A lot of educational software. Uh, they're really oriented towards schools and education products. So a lot of these games weren't all that great. Uh, but there were some that have become legendary. Uh, Oregon Trail, probably one of the most popular ones. So even though that's an educational game, which, by the way, was created in Minnesota. Uh, but it was supposed to be for education. <laughs> uh, but a lot of people, uh, they got these machines. You know, if you had some money or your dad was or mom or dad were into engineering or something, they might have given you a computer. You might have had one at home and you can learn to program on it. <clears throat> uh, the Apple II here in the corner in particular, uh, a lot of uh, early developers got this machine uh, John Romero, who created Doom, had one. And Carmack had one. Uh, Becky, Becky Berger Heinemann had one. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Lord British, uh, Richard Garriott had one. Uh, so a lot of these developers made their first games on an Apple II. So that's something really cool with a computer. Uh, you get the Atari, you're playing games, and that's all you can do. Uh, you get an Apple II, uh, there's a chance you might actually make a game on your Apple II, and you could sell it and get rich. <laughs> so, and so that was a, a big plus. Uh, and then, yeah, there's just briefly some of the games I feel like we just have to mention. I mean, Pac-Man, Turo Iwatani. Abs I, I don't think you can appreciate how big this game was. And part of it was just video games were new enough. It was like a cool thing to play video games. It was uh, rad, you know. <laughs> and what made this one stand out was they had these characters, Pac-Man, 
uh, it was kind of a character, and they had a cartoon and a serial, and it was like a fun thing to license, and you had like a Pac-Man on your lunchbox. So you kind of had personality. And if you play these games and miss Pac-Man, or the Pac-Man series, there's a little movies. It's kind of a stretch to call it a cutscene, but sort of a little bit of a story around it. Uh, but the kids just ate it up, and uh, so did the parents. Uh, there's a lot made about the Pac-Man being a, a game where you could master that. There were books you could buy about Pac-Man patterns, and you could figure out how to move Pac-Man around in such a way to, to achieve a very high score. It got very competitive, and people had a lot of fun with it. Uh, so there's a, a link there called webpacman.com. Uh, so I'll, let, I'll just let, leave it up to you. Play a couple of these games, or at least play Pac-Man. I got Space Invaders on there. Uh, Frogger is one that didn't get mentioned, but I think it's it's a great game. Uh, Snake shows up all the time. So just play a couple of these, uh, or just one at least, and then tell me what you think. All right, then moving on, we've got Donkey Kong, which you might have played this. Uh, this There's a movie called King of Kong uh, that's well worth watching. Uh, another documentary uh, where there's a guy trying to achieve like the highest ever Donkey Kong score. Uh, so it's still kind of a thing. But this is a movie, and I write about this in my Vintage Games book, which Shigeru Miyamoto, probably some call him the best video game des uh, designer of all time. I think he's got a pretty good, you know, he'd definitely be on my short list. I mean, just look at the games. Uh, Mario Brothers, not just Donkey Kong, but Mario Brothers, Super Mario, Zelda. He pretty much upheld it. I don't. Without him, I don't even know if Nintendo would still be around. To be honest with you, I mean, he's just he's come to their rescue many times uh, with a new Zelda game or a new Mario game. And it's just he's got a bunch of other games, but he's just people will buy a system just to be playing one of these games that he uh, designed. So big, big super uh, developer. Uh, but the neat thing about Donkey Kong was it was uh, almost like a a movie in some ways. It had a story. It had discrete levels to it. Uh, it had characters. It had a lot of personality, which I think is, you know, you could tell. Just, I could tell just by looking at a picture here of Miyamoto. I mean, the guy's got a good personality. He's uh, he's a creative, he's original, and I think that really comes across in his games. It's not just blowing up look-alike uh, aliens. I mean, you play Donkey Kong, you get a sense of like a, almost like a Godzilla movie or a King Kong uh, movie, if you watch those, it's kind of a sense of that spirit in the games. And of course, the uh, Mario Brothers, you got these plumbers running around. Uh, just, uh, I'm sure you played, at least played uh, Super Mario Brothers, but you know, I think it's well worth looking at Miyamoto's games and thinking about you know, what, make, what makes those games so great. Uh, another one, this is a, a game from uh, Europe, uh, England specifically, or the UK, uh, Elite. Uh, David Braben, Ian Bell, 84. And this was on like the BBC Micro, I think, or the Acorn. So this is one of these computers that was popular in Britain, I think in some European countries. Never really made it here. Uh, they did port it on to some other computers, though. Uh, so what's neat about Elite was this is one of the early... Now it's, it's not wasn't the first, uh, but it's one of these early games you might call something like an open world game where there's you, you're you not really told like you have to do the game a certain way. I mean, you could be a space pirate, go around shooting up, shooting down merchants, stealing their cargo. Could be a bounty hunter. Uh, you could work uh, quests, uh, missions. Those are, those are kind of rare. Uh, they built up on that later. You could just be a trader, you know, going from system to system and just making money that way. You can upgrade your ship, different weapons, different uh, shields and so on. So it's kind of a role-playing element. You know, this is another one that uh, my dad and I, we just, uh, this game just... <laughs> <laughs> it really took over our lives. <laughs> remember I would play it. There was a point where I would play it uh, when I got home from school. And then he, he was working a night shift. So on his days off, uh, you know, I'd play it during the day. I'd go uh, go to sleep. And then he'd take over and, like, play until he got tired. So we were playing a, a heck of a lot of elite uh, together just to try to get, I don't even know. We're, we're trying to, like, get the best possible ship or some such. Uh, but the cool thing about this game, too, was it was, uh, what they call procedurally generated. So instead of just having a set number of planets and a set number of uh, worlds, they would <clears throat> just create, I forget how many millions of planets. So you'd never really run out of stuff to do, uh, even though it was a tiny little disk. and It wasn't that much code. 
you, know, you didn't need like 50,000 disks, uh, but they were able to use these uh, algorithms basically to produce this huge world. And you see that same sort of thing in games like Rogue. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get into that here, but there's ways to simulate a big world without having to hard code it or do it all yourself. Uh, here's another big game from the era, SimCity. And again, this is one you might have played. I hope you've played at least some version of SimCity. Really brilliant game. Just so much fun. Uh, this is the one Will, Will Wright created. And he's one of these figures that have become important, not just because he makes these great games, but he talks a lot about game development, game design. He's kind of a, a philosopher, basically. But you can see this uh, in these games. You're, you're excuse me, playing the role of a mayor or a city planner. So you're figuring like where to put residential zones, where do you put your fact, your power plants and so on, and parks, keep your people happy, keep the traffic flowing. Uh, so people, this is another good example too of a game where nobody was wanted to publish this. They're like, this is the dumbest idea for a game I've ever heard. <laughs> Get the heck out of here. <laughs> uh, you know, this is crazy. Uh, go back to making those shooter games, uh, which he was making before this. Uh, but, you know, he persisted and finally got this thing published. And, of course, it just took off like gangbusters. And it was everywhere. Schools, I mean, just huge. Made the guy a, uh, a tremendous amount of money. Uh, but it just kind of came out of left field. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody would have, Nobody looking at this game back in the... Uh, I think he were... I don't know how long it took him to get it, get it published. But, you know, nobody would have looked at this and said, Oh, that's, that's going to be a big hit. Uh it just was almost kind of word of mouth advertising. People got into it and they, somebody told, you know, this is, this game looks like, doesn't look like much, but it's a lot of fun, you know, and somebody else would play it. And we still see that sometimes, uh, games like uh, Minecraft. You know, I bet the first time you just looked at that game, you probably just thought, eh, yeah, it doesn't look very good. But then your friend was like, no, no, you gotta, you, you gotta play this. <laughs> There's way more to it. Uh, so you might have gotten into it that way. So this, it still happens today, right? Um, adventure games. This is just some more adventure games I think everybody should play at some point. Uh, we talked about the text ones already. Zork, Enchanter, Planetfall. Uh, there's a Sierra line. I think these were based in, I'm pretty sure they were in, uh, where were they, California for a while? And then uh, Texas. I forget exactly where they were. Sort of out in the middle of nowhere, so they didn't have to pay these uh, big taxes. Uh, they they put out a line of games called King's Quest, and there was a Space Quest, a Police Quest, a Quest for Glory. You can probably sense the theme there. They did a Gabriel Knight series later on. Uh, known for employing a lot of women. You know, it's a lot of the uh, famous uh, women or female developers and designers work for Sierra. The co-president or uh, the co-founder was Roberta Williams, and she was the creative uh, vision, and then her husband, uh, Ken Williams was doing the programming on these early games. Uh, but they made a whole empire basically out of this. And a lot of these are kind of crappy, but you know, at the very least you should try them out just to see where we, uh, how we got to where we are now. Um, I love those Gabriel Knight series too. That's another, that's Jane Jensen that did those. And the Quest for Glory games, again, that's another husband-wife uh, team. Uh, you might have played those. If you haven't, you should familiarize yourself. I wouldn't recommend the Leisure Suit Larry <laughs> <laughs> those are dirty games it's kind of like porkies uh, a lot of dirty jokes it's not too bad it's like pg-13 humor but uh you know not something that i would want to recommend to you necessarily uh in lucasfilm games uh there's, there's one here called the secret of monkey island and they also did maniac mansion a sam and max series uh the telltale games you might have uh, seen those uh, like the walking dead one uh, they did some games based on these early ones. Some Indiana Jones games they did. Uh, Loom gets they. For some reason, these authors love this Loom game, and I have uh, interviewed the uh, designer of that, uh, David Fox, who also did Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. You know, it's it's amazing to me that this you know these the authors of our book they never mention like any of my stuff. <laughs> it's kind of annoying. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Uh, the Lucasfilm games like Monkey Island here, a lot of people prefer these. They were more popular in Europe than in the U.S. for whatever reason. But the nice thing about these games is you can't die and you can't get the game stuck. Uh, a lot of the troubles with games like King's Quest 
you know, you just get stuck. You can't get past a puzzle or you keep dying uh, or you mess up at an early point in the game and then you can't finish it. Uh, the Lucasfilm games, they undid that so that you could, you know, any reasonably uh, intelligent person can finish the game. Now, you might get stuck in a few spots, but it's not meant to be so tricky. Uh, you know, it's games that you're supposed to be able to finish and have a good time and it's really good humor. You know, I think if you haven't played Secret of Monkey Island, uh, you're really, again, missing out. Uh, go to Steam, uh, get a copy of it. Uh, they have some versions now that are you can play on a modern system. Uh, I think you have a lot of good good times with that. And same thing with that first uh, Sam and Max game. Uh, really, it's hard to go wrong with any of those uh, Info, or, uh, Lucasfilm games. Uh, the Sierra games are fun, too. Uh, again, though, those you might need a clue book or a walkthrough. Uh, to help you get through them because they can be very tough but again a lot of personality a lot of fun characters and uh, you want to try it at least once <clears throat> uh, and here's some early role-playing games so you can get a sense of what these look like and there's Ultima over there uh, Richard Garriott sort of one person one man uh, Richard Garriott I think he was uh, I don't know if he was in out of high school I think he was making his games in high school and then uh, made a business out of it ultimately wasn't his first game he made one called Calabeth and yes I've interviewed people that worked on all three of these games <laughs> you can uh, watch them on Matt Chat uh, uh, but this is Wizardry here in the middle and this one and the Ultima game these were both uh, very popular in Japan and a lot of the games like Dragon Quest Dragon Warrior they, those were inspired by these and this wizardry, wizardry series is still active I mean there's still people in Japan playing and making wizardry games and some of those haven't been translated yet um, and then over here on the right side we see a uh, pool of radiance which is really the first uh, there were some console games but to me this is really the first true Dungeons and Dragons licensed uh, computer game where they really try to make an effort to get the rules right. Uh, some of the early ones are basically just arcade games with kind of a Dungeons and Dragons tie-in. There's some exceptions. Uh, but this is really where they focus in and get it done uh, properly, in my opinion. All right, here's a couple of the early consoles. Uh, Nintendo and Sega, you, if you're old enough, you remember this rivalry. They got kind of vicious. I mean, there were a lot of uh, a lot of people lost their lives. And <laughs> okay, that's an exaggeration, but uh, yeah, I remember that. You know, you had the Nintendo NES, and then you had the Sega Master System, and then the Sega Genesis, and the Super Nintendo. It kind of went on and on. And there's always this argument on the playground about hey, my you know my system's faster, and my my system has better graphics, and you know well my mine has Mario, and then the uh, other one would have Sonic. The Hedgehog, you know, so kind of this back and forth rivalry. Uh, but really, if you want to get, if you want to, at this point, you know, something I didn't mention with these computers I meant to mention was that the piracy. Uh, the reason that uh, it was kind of hard to make a living doing computer games is that somebody could take a game and just copy it and crack or crack it, what they called it, take the copy protection off, and then just give copies of it to all their friends. And, you know, those people wouldn't be buying copies. So instead of paying $60 for this copy of Monkey Island, uh, just get a pirated version. You know, get your friend to make a copy for you, and now you can play it for free. Uh, so they, I mean, the that was so widespread, rampant. Uh, they just, could, even though a lot of people had computers, they weren't buying software. They were pirating it, kind of like with the tapes and CDs. You know, people would just make a copy of a tape. Uh, the CD, you couldn't really copy the CD uh, the same way, unless you, I guess you could make it onto a tape, but you know, there for a while there was a there's a reason the publishers like the the uh, formats that are hard to copy. You know, there's not many people that can copy a Nintendo cartridge. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, so that was a problem for computers. But then eventually it happened on consoles as well with the PlayStation. You know, there for a while it was uh, really expensive to copy these discs. CD-ROMs, uh, but then uh, pretty soon you had CD burners, right? And there were ways to, if you knew what you were doing, you'd get a chip in your console. Uh, but even then, I don't think most people did that. You know, I, I remember looking for an Xbox on uh, 
Craigslist and eBay one time, and they were talking like some would be chipped, and that meant that they had somehow made it so that you could just download a, something off Pirate Bay and uh, put it on disk, burn it yourself, and it would run. Uh, whereas some of these systems would not let you do that. Now, I'm not going to get into like the technical stuff there, but that's my understanding anyway. Uh, let's see, what was I saying? Oh, the PlayStation and the Xbox. Again, one of the advantages of the CD-ROM versus the cartridge was you could put a whole lot more data on that. Uh, so you could have a lot more graphics, a lot more music. You could have, instead of just having like doop, 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 doop kind of music, uh, you could actually have a recording of a real concert uh, orchestra, you know, they could record them. You could just put it on there just like it was a CD and uh, have that digitized. Uh, same thing, you could have a lot more elaborate cutscenes, just a lot more content in general, and it didn't cost nearly as much. Uh, so Sony was really making a lot of money with this. Nintendo didn't want to do it because they were afraid, again, of this piracy. You know, if Once you have a disc, then anybody can just copy the disc. Uh, so that they, they were kind of held off for a long time, and some people say that's why they People thought Nintendo was gone on the way out. Uh, of course, then they came out with the Wii and the uh, uh, the Game Boy Advance, and that you know that made a big difference. But uh, again, resistant for the piracy. And the Xbox, uh, the, one of the big innovations there is a hard drive. So not just a CD-ROM, but a hard drive where you can store a bunch of stuff on the system. And of course, they had these. Uh, Groundbreaking uh, games, uh, Halo. Yeah, here's some of the, some of these. Uh, First-person shooters. Uh, this is a genre that's pretty much ubiquitous now. Uh, a lot of people love first-person shooters, or what they call the third-person shooters, which is basically the same concept, except instead of having a, just a hand with a gun or a crosshair, you you see the character there. Um, and I have yes, I've interviewed John Romero, the creator of a lot of these games, co-creator. I've interacted with Carmack, and I haven't got to interview him yet, but a lot of other people too, a lot of the level designers. You know, I feel like I've talked to just about uh, a lot of people that had something to do with these games, you know, so i got a lot of different bases covered. Uh, but anyway, the this uh, genre did, Wolfenstein 3D is shown here in the top right, uh, that's the first one uh, that really put id on the map, but... Again, the, these authors get it a little bit wrong. There were lots of... Uh, er, they did several games in the style before this. Uh, there's one called Catacombs 3D. I think there's one called Hover Tank. And it's a little bit different, like the Hover Tank, you're in a vehicle. That's for some people, that that cancels that. Uh, the uh, the Catacombs, though, you're a wizard and you're, like, throwing fireballs. So to me, that's, that's kind of... Uh, you know, I'd call that a first-person shooter. It's not a gun... Uh, okay, but you know it's kind of getting just kind of getting into hair splitting. Uh, then you had games like Maze War, I think that's the name of it. Even before that, and so it's not like this is necessarily uh, nobody had ever thought about it before. Uh, but the thing was, ID was able to capitalize on it really well. They had Carmack and Romero, brilliant, brilliant programmers and coders. Uh, they knew how to make this really tight, make it run fast, make it exciting, and they had a shareware model. On top of that, which is something that doesn't get talked about enough, in my opinion, but instead of selling Doom in the store or dealing with all the pirates, uh, their strategy was just to say, yeah, we're just going to release the version of this for free. Uh, as sh they call it shareware. And the idea, idea was if you like the first level, you know, you could play with your friends, you could play Doom, you get your friends together and have these death matches, do all that for free. But if you want to get like the professional version, or you want to get the extra levels, then you send a check to uh, in, and then we'll, uh, or to, I forget the name of their publisher, uh, but we'll send you the full copy. And enough people did that that they got rich. You know, they're driving around like Ferraris and Lamborghinis. <laughs> uh, so that goes to show you sometimes uh, giving away something at first can be an incentive, uh, and then you can make your money later. And a lot of people learn that lesson. You know, if they tried to sell this in a store for 60 bucks, uh, maybe it wouldn't have done as well. A lot of people thought they were crazy uh, for doing this, but it, it paid out. Yeah, Doom here, Quake's another big one. And they, again, these authors, they drive me crazy sometimes. And they don't even mention, like, the big uh, console first-person shooter game. It wasn't Halo was later. Uh, GoldenEye 007 was the first big one. 
and this was 97 on a Nintendo system. What was it? The wasn't the GameCube. It must have been a Nintendo 64. I think I'm pretty sure I got a copy of it sitting over there. Uh, but I remember this one. The GoldenEye was a multiplayer game. It's a first-person shooter game. A lot of people that was their first exposure. They didn't play Doom. Uh, they didn't play Wolfenstein. They played this GoldenEye James Bond game first. And it was uh, what was great about it was it was really well mapped on a controller. So that was the problem before was, you know, these games are played with a mouse and a keyboard, you know, especially the <coughs> arrow keys and such. <coughs> and it was thought that just wouldn't work on a game pad. You know, you think about those early game pads, too. Uh, but the Nintendo, Nintendo 64, if you remember that, it had a special game pad uh, with some controls that were built into it for 3D games so that it worked well. And then, of course, uh, the Xbox was built with this in mind. Uh, so their controllers were built for first-person shooters, and Halo really took off. But uh, I don't think you, sh you should always, uh, you know, I don't think you want to ignore the GoldenEye game. Uh, so here's a link. I don't know if this will work for you. You might want to try a couple different browsers if it doesn't work. But see if you can get it to work. Uh, or if worse comes to worse, you can jump on Steam and probably find it for next to nothing. See if you can find the original Doom, though, uh, from the 90s. Play it a little bit, and then come back and talk about why you think it was such a big deal. All right, and here's some fighting games. I mentioned these already, but again, a, another genre that's still around. You know, I think there's just came out with a new Mortal Kombat not too long ago. Not really my thing. My brother Luke, uh, he's really big into uh, Mortal Kombat, so I'm always hearing about it from him. He's always wanting to challenge me. Again, it kind of comes back to that idea of the agon or the competitive game. I mean, a lot of people just love competing. You know, they want a game where they can literally beat you up. Uh, I think that must be every little brother's dream, is to beat up his uh, older brother. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, a couple of big ones there, Street Fighter II, uh, Mortal Kombat. Uh, Mortal Kombat, it, it always gets brought up in any discussion of violence because it had these gruesome uh, fatalities. So I thought, you know, if you are squeamish, don't bother. Uh, but if, you've, if you're up to it, it's not, it's like, you know, 1990s graphics. <laughs> Uh, but just, you know, check out the video and then talk about why you think that led to such controversy. Because uh, it did. It got it made the circuits. All the talking heads were saying we got to ban video games now because of a Mortal Kombat. So what? You know, there had been violent games before. What was it about that that made it so over the top? All right, so I mentioned the PlayStation really benefiting from that CD-ROM. I mean, they had Final Fantasy VII on CD-ROM. It just blew everything that had come before it away. People just thought it was like the, <laughs> the best thing they'd ever seen. <laughs> uh, but before that, it, it happened on the computers, uh, the PCs, and I think also the, I'm pretty sure the Macintosh had, I know they had Mist, I don't know about the seventh guest, but uh, they the computer developers were making adventure games on CD-ROMs. And I don't know how impressive this looks to you now, but at the time, this was just like, wow, these graphics are amazing. It, it was because they could use the these supercomputers, uh, the craze and whatnot, to make these amazingly detailed graphics, render them, and then just store them on the disk. Uh, so it took an enormous amount of storage. You know, whole oh, megabytes. <laughs> it just would have taken like 50,000 disks, floppy disks, uh, but they could put this all in one CD-ROM with the digitized music. You know, they brought in real musicians like the Fat Man. Uh, and these guys are enormous hits. You know, people who were buying CD-ROMs or buying new computers just to be able to play these games. Uh, and they're puzzle-based games. You know, you run around, there's a story, but you're basically solving logic puzzles. Uh, Myst is another great game. I think it holds up really well even today. Uh, some people criticize it. I, I don't think they know what they're talking about. It's a brilliant game, and, and Riven, the whole series is amazing. Uh, but I remember back when Mist came out, people were saying, this is like the, the most beautiful game, and it really tests your intelligence. You know, So if you want to prove how smart you are, play Mist and see if you can beat it without having to use any clues or walkthroughs. And that brings us up through the MMOs, and I'm trying to keep an eye on the time here. I know we don't want to go on forever even though we could. But you just really quickly here see some of the evolution in graphics. Now, Ultima Online, going back to Garriott again, trying to uh, 
take that mud idea, but make a graphical front end for it, which means they could put all the graphics and stuff on your computer, and then the the network would just be transmitting like what people said or the results of battles and dice rolls and so on and so forth. Uh, so Ultimate Online was the first big MMO, and it was like maybe 100,000. Every time there's like an order of magnitude bigger game. Uh, EverQuest uh, came out next around 99, just a few years later. Sony EverQuest. And I've, again, talked to some of the people associated with all three of these. Uh, but the EverQuest was the one that I think really took the world by storm. Uh, you know, a lot of people were playing this or again, buying computers, buying modems, getting online just to play it. Uh, and you can think about the years here of you know, how broadband internet, you know, you don't want to play these games on a crummy dial-up system. Uh, you know, the, if you have a broadband connection, everything runs much smoother, allows for much better gameplay. Uh, and then, of course, World of Warcraft over here. Again, just blew everything that came before it away. People are still playing World of Warcraft, as I'm sure you know. But if you think about what's going on in the background here, the rise of the Internet, broadband, the consoles weren't connected to anything for a long time. It was really not till the, I would say probably the Xbox 360 and maybe the PS2. Somewhere in there, in the so, uh, Sega had a Dreamcast system. But, you know, it took a while for them to really get online. And once they got online, you know, things started to happen there as well. But really, even to this day, I think, you see, if you really like MMOs, if you want to play, uh, like World of Warcraft, you have to have a computer. Uh, so it's still not quite the same. Uh, they also mentioned Grand Theft Auto in 2001, another one of these <coughs> big open-world games, very controversial. You know, people go on about the, the violence in this. Uh, so it got a lot of uh, bad publicity. But on a positive note, very innovative in terms of gameplay mechanics and uh, the quest structure of that is very interesting. The customization. Uh, some other developments worth thinking about. Uh, the distribution revolution. Uh, they talk, that's kind of fancy. They, they get into like DLC or downloadable content. Uh, so the idea there is instead of just making money once, you know, off of selling a game in a store for 60 bucks. You could uh, just put the game out for free, and then you make your money by saying, well, if you want a hat, if you want this cool hat for your character, that's going to cost you 10 bucks." Uh, or it also, I think, brings in mind the uh, like a Steam game or the, all these online stores we talked about. So you, don't ha you can skip the Walmart, skip the GameStop, just buy the game directly, and then make a lot more money that way. Uh, the social games, this sort of seems to me to have sort of come and gone. I, I don't know what you think about this. I don't play any of these games anymore. Uh, but there for a while, there was this big push for Facebook games. There was the, I remember uh, Farmville was the first big one. Uh, then there was uh, Words with Friends, I think was the name of that. Like Golfing with Friends, there's a bunch of them. Uh, but the idea there is you're playing this with friends on these social networks. And apparently there are a lot of people made their fortunes that way. Uh, another development is uh, the body is interface or augmented reality. You know, we talked a little there about Pokemon Go. If you haven't played that yet, uh, you should definitely try it out. You can play it on your phone. And uh, I'm like, I don't want to really spoil it for you. you know, just, just download it, play a little bit, see what you think. That's the best way to learn about these things. Because uh, uh, it's hard to, to really know what the fuss is about if you're just getting it secondhand. So play it. Uh, gamification is this other movement. It's a weird word, but again, the idea there is to take some of the stuff that we've learned about game design, see if we can apply it to other things, such as education. You can we make uh, kids, they, they love playing games. They don't like doing math, <laughs> math homework. <laughs> you know, maybe if we make the math homework more like playing a game, uh, they might like it. You know, So there's been efforts to do that. Uh, one of my favorite examples is one called Physicus. So it's a game like Myst, but the puzzles are all about real physics. So if you hate physics, play Physicus. And you can actually, I think it's a brilliant game uh, because uh, it puts everything into a context, makes it fun, and it gives you a desire to learn uh, physics beyond just making a good grade on a test. I mean, this you're trying to get to the next part of, this, of the story. Okay, some perspectives then. My throat's about to go out. Uh, the future of games is hard to predict. Yes, it has. I can tell you this as a game historian so many times 
uh, the Pac-Man. You know, they were trying to bring Pac-Man to the U.S., and these uh, guys that were uh, in charge of these uh, companies, they had the choice between Pac-Man, and the other one was a game called Rally X, and there was some, I think the third one was like a balloon game. And the guys were like, let's do that Rally X. That, I think that's going to be the hit. And, I mean, you can laugh at that. Like, what, what, you know, what idiots. <laughs> How could anybody look at Pac-Man and not see a hit? Uh, but they were saying, well, it's, it's a stupid idea. You know, like this thing going around chomping on these bits. And what, what the hell's up with these ghosts? Uh, it's just kind of eating a ghost. I mean, it's kind of weird uh, when you hear it described. Uh, so that's another good good uh, reason to actually play a game instead of just hearing it described because you don't there's no way I could describe Pac-Man to you and, and you get it you just have to play it uh, to see what the fuss was about uh, so anyway that said some things do seem likely yes the hassle-free distribution so they these authors think that we won't have this problem anymore of like this is going to be exclusive to the you have to have an Xbox to play this game if you want to play this game, you have to have a PlayStation. This game's only on the Switch. Uh, this game's only on Android, etc. Uh, they talk about a hassle-free distribution, uh, accommodation for different screen sizes, and so on. Personally, I don't think this is true. You know, I think there's just too much incentive to keep on with the exclusives, and uh, they want these to be distinctive experiences. So, so I don't know. I don't know why you'd ever want to have a Halo come out on a PlayStation and Nintendo, you know, it, it doesn't seem likely to me that that would happen. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, in some cases, sure. Uh, game designers will identify game elements which can be applied regardless of platform. So again, that same idea. Uh, right now, there's a, it's a very different market. If you want to do iPhone games, you have to think about the nature of an iPhone or an iPad and the touch capability and, you know, Angry Birds, there's a lot of games that work great on an iPhone that just wouldn't, they don't work very well on a PC, for example, uh, or on, even on a different phone. Uh, but maybe something could be done about that, we'll see. Uh, the last one's probably the one that I think is most likely. Uh, games will demand their share of cultural attention. Look at this class. You know, this, for many years, when I first got here, uh, they thought this was uh, ludicrous, like a game about or a course about video games, absolutely not going to happen. These are frivolous. You know, this is what we want people, this is what we want students not doing. <laughs> we don't want them playing games. We want them reading books and uh, watching uh, great films, maybe. Uh, but this is kind of gone now, right? Everybody knows uh, the video games are here to stay and they're a big deal. Uh, and I forgot to put my usual slide here, so I'll just have to, uh, to ask you to, Please uh, put a comment here, <laughs> ask a question. Love to hear from you. I know this has gone on for a long time, so sorry about that. Uh, but I do hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.